I think for all of us that there's, a, there's something special about attending a banquet or a feast or some special event of that nature, you know, maybe it's a special birthday party of some kind that's celebrating somebody's, uh, you know, somebody's maybe turning significant age or maybe it's a wedding situation. And, you know, there's just something about being a participant in that and when you celebrate it that you rejoice with those people. But I think at the end of the day, all of us, well, I think the part we enjoy more than anything else is the food. And, uh, you know, we hear it's a certain restaurant or there's a certain cook that's involved that, that appeals to us. And, of course, as we think about historically, feasts and banquets have been an important part of the monarchies. And uh, I, I think probably the greatest feasts that have ever been conducted and held and the greatest number of guests fed have probably been uh, something that kings have done. One of those, I was doing some study research about that. One of them was, a, was the coronation banquet that King George IV uh, had in 1821. It was a massive, lavish, I mean, well-laid-out event that he did for his coronation as the King of England. It was held in the vaulted ceilings of Westminster Hall, and everything was just lavishly decorated with chandeliers and long, grand dining tables. And, of course, as he said at the head of the, of the room at his, the table uh, for the feast, of course, as you, looked, as you could look at any pictures of drawings that they have, the food was center stage. I mean, it was it was. Literally, as we would have a feast fit for a king. I mean, it was just sumptuous. I mean, the tables were just filled and crowded with food that was overflowing there. And so he, had, he asked his trusted chef, Marie Antoine Cardemé, to do something special for that. And so she, uh, she did, and she wound up inventing what wound up becoming the king's favorite dish, believe it or not, turtle soup, you know. And I don't know if you ever had turtle soup. But I've had it once, didn't necessarily... Turn me on, if, you, if I can say that's not something I would normally would enjoy, but whatever she did to it, she made it very sumptuous. It became one of his favorite dishes, and uh, they served some 80 bowls of this very, very expensive soup at that coronation banquet. They also had a model temple that was decked with sweet meats, marzipan, and sugar that uh, each guest was able to break off some pieces and eat, kind of like a gingerbread house type of thing there. But definitely the, the word that everybody had about that it was that it was a very sumptuous feast that everyone enjoyed. And of course, we, we have modeled from that that phrase that when you have a great, great uh, banquet of some kind, uh, they call it a feast that's fit for a king, just like a king would do something like that. Go to our passage tonight in Psalms 23. And uh, we are continuing on where we left off in verse 4. In verse 4, we see David walking through this valley, which he describes as the valley of the shadow of death. It is not death itself, but it's the, the shadow of it. It's the fear, the anxiety, the apprehension that there's uncertainty around the corner. You're not sure what it holds. And yet, in spite of all that, what, what encourages us in verse 4 is that David was comforted. He said, even though I walked through the valley of shadow death, he says, I will fear no evil. It doesn't matter what the evil is. It doesn't matter who the enemy is. It doesn't matter if there's an avalanche. It doesn't matter if there's a, a rock slide. It doesn't matter if we're attacked by coyotes. It doesn't matter if they're bears. It doesn't matter if our physical enemies, and I'll describe that tonight, uh, their physical enemies attack us. He said, I will fear no evil. It doesn't matter what the evil is. Let it be. It doesn't matter if there's a rain and a sudden flash flood while we're going through this valley. That doesn't cause me any fear. David could boldly say as he was going, Earth is certain valley that I will fear no evil. Now that's important because for many of us, a valley like that has many uncertainties. It has many twists and turns to it. Things we cannot anticipate. Things we cannot plan for. Things we're not really sure it happens. And as we have setback after setback after setback, and that's typically what happens in a valley setting. If we have setback after setback after setback, we start to second guess ourselves. We start to doubt the promises of God. We start to blank out about God's involvement and God's care about our life. And we start worrying about the what if situation. We, what, we think about what if this happens? What if I run out of money? What if the interest rates go up? What if, what if my savings crash? What if, the, what if the securities brokerage firm goes broke and there's not enough SIPC insurance to protect them and all these other kinds of things here? I mean, we worry about these things. We worry about the, what we were looking at hopefully cashing in one day that is crash. And we worry about if we lose our jobs. We worry about what if we, we lose our health and we worry about the situation like what, what, if I, what if I had a stroke or what if I got cancer with these things like that. And all of these fears come upon us and honestly, they're one of the many sets of evils that can grip us. But David said it this way. He summed it all up by saying this. He says, it doesn't matter what's in that valley. I will fear no evil. 
And it's just David boldly saying, you know, I don't know what's around that corner, but I don't fear any evil. And the reason why he could say that is because David was comforted by his shepherd. He said, you're with me, God, and because you're with me, I'm comforted. I don't have to fear any evil. I'm just comforted by the presence of God. And I'm also comforted, as we saw last week, about the rod and the staff which my shepherd carries. Now, we don't have time to go back over that tonight, but we saw on one extreme the rod is a weapon. We saw on the other extreme the staff is used for walking, for worship. We talked about that last week a little bit there. But David said, I'm comforted. I'm comforted because God is with me. My shepherd's with me. I'm comforted because the rod and the staff of my shepherd, they comfort me. Now, he's not done yet. In the midst of all this, he's not out of the valley yet. He hasn't ascended yet to where he's in these new green pastures where he's leading, where, where as a sheep he's being led to. He's just found the shepherd. He's just found the shepherd step by step, moment by moment, with the shepherd where the shepherd wants him to go. <laughs> so we have to imagine here in verse 4, David is riding still as a sheep. And he talks about this valley of the shadow of death, and he talks about in verse 5 these enemies. And I want you to imagine with me for just a moment what David is looking at. Circling overhead are these buzzards or vultures, birds of prey, birds that eat dead flesh, circling and watching because they can smell that David has been languishing. He's been without a meal for a period of time. And they're circling overhead thinking, I wonder if that's going to be our next meal. Around him, perched up on the ledges, different places are possibly mountain lions, possibly coyotes hiding somewhere, possibly bears that would, in their dens up in those, those upper mountain areas there. And so David's making his way around there, uh, wondering when the heat of the day and lack of food and things like that, he's, that, that's kind of the setting he's under there. He's just, you know, he's, he's, he's in the presence of his enemies. And then on top of that, he's got other enemies, which, we'll, as I said earlier, we'll speak about. That's the setting David's talking about. And he says right in the midst of that, he's got this, he calls it a, a sh the shadow of death. And then he says this statement that's, just, that's very encouraging. He says, now, I'm hungry. I've been thirsting. I've been famishing. Um... You know, I could hear the howl of the coyotes. I'm looking up ahead and I see this, these large wingspan birds of prey above me, these buzzards circling over me. And he makes this statement, he says, and yet, Lord, you've prepared a table before me. God has prepared for me a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, if you might want to put in your margin next time you read this passage, the table here he's referring to is speaking symbolically of a king's table. He's saying that the presence of what's there is that God has provided for him a, the equivalent of a sumptuous banquet, if you would, a feast fit for a king. And really what he's saying here in verse 5, he is praising the Lord. He's giving glory to God for taking care of his every need. How many thankful tonight God takes care of your needs? Amen. How many thankful tonight God's timing in your life, amen? I mean, just, just so good. I was in a meeting yesterday, and uh, we're just reflecting on a number of things going on in this meeting I was in, and just uh, the preacher asked me, he said, uh, he said, Brother Fong, do you have any comment to make to the men today about what, 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 what's going on? And I said, preacher, I said, the only thing I could tell the men is that, the, that today was just very solid, concrete evidence that the hand of God is on this ministry, and because the hand of God's on the ministry, I could talk about it from a timing standpoint, the provision standpoint, all of God's doing there. And that's what David's doing here. David's giving glory and praise to a God in heaven who met his every need. He's just saying, God takes care of me. I mean, David didn't write it. Paul did. But, you know, Paul wrote, my God should supply your every need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And, and, you know, he's saying here, God supplied my every need. And he's just praising God that at a time when he was most needy, God prepared a table before him and met his need there. And he 
said, you know, God, he's testifying God provided for him what another psalmist, Asaph, wrote about in Psalm 78. He said, well, you know, God provided for me a table in the wilderness. You know, the old Hebrews questioned God. They mocked God. They said, can God provide a table in the wilderness? And David said, well, you know, I want you to know something. My God did provide a table for me in the wilderness, and my God is providing for me here. And God, he says, look, I, I want to tell everybody about this feast fit for the king. I want everybody to know about how that thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. So tonight I want you to journey with me to this valley again. And I want you to notice in this first half of verse 5, God's abounding care in David's life. And I want us to take that this evening, and we're going to see doctrinally its importance in our, in our faith and our practices. But then I want us to see tonight, as we look at this verse, the great promise that's embedded inside of that, that you and I can claim and, and, and place into our life. Because, you know, God wants all of us to know that in the midst of every valley, God makes a feast fit for every king. Amen. So I want you to notice some things. There are three things I want you to see tonight. Notice, first of all, the lonesome surroundings. The lonesome surroundings. David speaks about the presence of mine enemies. Elizabeth Elliot wrote a book about that. You might want to get this. Just her testimony about she was the wife of Jim Elliot. Just wrote a testimony about how the, the, the very people of Ecuador that they went to serve, how, how her husband, Jim Elliot and Nate Saint, that they had gone there to uh, reach these people the gospel. And they'd done some initial survey trips. And then how, how they, the, when they when they their plane, they got in there, and they landed inside there that all, all five of these missionary men were killed. And, you know, one was Jim Elliott, Elizabeth's wife, and Elizabeth determined there was a young widow. I mean, when I say young widow, she was in her early 20s, ladies. She decided she was going to go back, she was going to stay in that mission field, minister those people. And uh, through the course of that, I have a picture of the man who killed Jim Elliott, one of, our, one, of our, uh, one of our preacher friends of mine up in Wisconsin, uh, traveled over that area. He actually took a picture of that man. He's a much older man. He took a picture of the man that killed Jim Elliott, and he got saved. Jesus Christ is Savior. And Elizabeth Elliot spent the rest of her life just saying, in the presence of my enemies, those who were my enemies, I ministered to them, gave them the gospel. Those people opened their hearts, and the Lord did some, has done some great things, but it involves sacrifice to them. And I want you to notice here that David's, David speaks about these enemies, and he's referring to these enemies. And if you would tonight, I want you this, in this surrounding, I want you to see, I want you to see the enemies of his adversity. When David speaks about enemies, he's speaking about adversity. Adversity is not your friend. And I believe the timing in which David is writing about here, the timing is when his son Absalom has revolted against him. You'll find that in 2 Samuel 14. Absalom was a spoiled Overindulge, adult young man. He surreptitiously betrayed his father, stole the hearts of the people, led a revolt where all the loyal men turned to him, well, the ones he thought were loyal to him, and led this revolt. Joining him was David's trusted counselor for many years, Ahithophel. And there's some verses I want you to see tonight from 2 Samuel 15 that just briefly describes to us the nature and the extent of this adversity. Listen to what David said in 2 Samuel 15, 17. And the king went forth, and all the people after this is when, he, they, then they, when they realized this revolt was happening, they said, we got to leave. And the men that were loyal to David stayed with them, like, you know, Joab and Benaiah, men like that. But the men, that the people that left with him was a much smaller number than the ones who remained in the kingdom. And the king went forth and all the people after him. And the Bible says they tarried, listen to this, they tarried in a place that was far off. <coughs> That's adversity. He was far from home. He tarried, he lived, he sojourned for a period of time in a place that was far off. <coughs> he went from the palace to where there were pits. He went to where there were buildings to all the ones with sand. Look at verse 23. <coughs> and all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over, nor says, towards the way of the wilderness. 
The wilderness is a picture of trials, adversity. Look at verse 30. And David went up by the ascent of the Mount Olivet and wept as he went up and had his head covered and he went barefoot, which was symbolic of being broken and just being, just being very broken about his situation. It was a shame for kings to take their sandals off. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up, weeping as they went up. I mean, notice phrases like, in a place far off, towards the way of the wilderness, by the ascent of Mount Olivet. David is describing in very descriptive terms for us what adversity is all about. Uh, let me give you some additional definitions. Jacob the patriarch Jacob in Genesis described his adversity as this. He said, all these things are against me. That's how you feel. All these people and all these things are against me. Uh, listen to what Job said, how he described adversity. Job described adversity as being full of trouble. Uh, Paul described adversity in Acts 27. He's described it as being tossed with a tempest and so severe that he said this, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. Now that's extreme adversity when your mind, when things are so bad, when the sun hasn't come out, and the moon and the stars are all, all or that's all you see, and your, your ship is going in circles, and the sail is broken, and the ship feels like it's breaking apart. I mean, you feel like all hope that we should be saved is taken away. That's exactly how you feel about adversity in its extreme. Paul just used another phrase to describe it. He described it this way in another passage as this. He said, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Adversity is when you have difficulty and a trouble in a place that's far off. You are not where you're comfortable. You are not where you expect to be. You're, you're not even up to your neck, as Isaiah would say, up to your neck in trouble. You're over your head in trouble. You feel like you're drowning in it. You're not sure how far it's going to go. You feel like you're in a quicksand situation that's sucking you in. You, you, feel like, you feel like my friend Brother Gibson said to me on the Saturday his wife went home to be with the Lord. He, felt, he said, preacher, I, don't, I just can't get a hold of God. And that, that's just to me, that from a preacher to preacher, that's just kind of like, wow, that's just, man, that's a pretty deep place to be at right, in your life there. But can you imagine being in a place in your life you can't get a hold of God? Can you imagine being in a place in your life where you feel like you're in a fog, you can't think very clearly, your emotions are raw, you don't know if you're happy, you don't know if you're sad, where you've cried, and you've cried so much there's no more tears that could come out of your eye ducts, your tear ducts? I mean, can you imagine a place when you just, you're just getting up in the morning is painful, turning on your side is painful, and just thinking about when your thoughts go back recurrently about that pain, your experience, that adversity, that it hurts you inside, it's riveting you from the sole of your feet to the crown of your head? I mean, can you imagine adversity so bad that you're not even sure if you're even come out of this, and you just, maybe you just feel like, you know, I don't even know if I'm going to live. I just don't know if I'm going to die. I don't know what's going to go happen here. Your world is turned upside down. You're overcome with anxiety, fear, and uncertainty. You wonder what's around the corner. You wonder, will I make it? Everything around you is dark and lonesome. I mean, he's in a lonesome surrounding because his enemies included his adversity. His enemies included his adversaries. Absalom, his own son, his own flesh and blood betrayed him and sought to kill him. Now I can understand a father wanting to kill his son. I can't understand, I can't grasp someone wanting to kill his father. But we live in a day and age, and when I mean by that, it's just, you know, sometimes you get so, you, you know, okay, do you get it there, you know? But I mean, we live in a day and age, it's, it's nothing today. Kids take a gun or a knife and kill their parents. It's amazing. And here's a son. He betrayed his father and sought to kill him. He sold the kingdom. Ahithophel, who went from being the king's counselor to being the king's greatest critic, joining ranks with him. Shimei, later on, who's of the house of Saul, not even fearful of David, realizing David is a, is a broken man, goes out there in that wilderness area, and he sees him, and he's cursing him out. I mean, he's just cursing him out, and he's throwing rocks at him, and he's just cursing him, and he's just saying all these terrible, terrible things to David. I mean, that's where David was at. I mean, David David is the hunted. Uh, David is watched, and he's being pursued. He's speaking about the presence of his enemies. He's not only talking about his adversity, he's talking about his adversary. I mean, listen to what Nehemiah said about adversarial situations. He said this in Nehemiah 4.11, and our adversary said, they shall not know, neither see, 
see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. Hey, listen, your adversaries, your enemies are seeking to take you out. That's why the devil is not your friend. The devil is called your adversary. Your adversary, the devil, walketh about seeking who he may devour. I mean, I want you to capture the image of that. Lions, they travel the savannas. They travel areas, they crouch very low. They're crouching lions looking very low. Read over there in Genesis 30, 49. He talks about crouching lions. They're crouching very low. They're, they're watching flocks. They're watching herds. They're looking for the young. They're looking for the newborn. They're looking for the lame. They're looking for the weak. They're looking for the ones that will give them the least amount of resistance, the ones who are least suspecting, or the ones who tend to wander off by them. They're looking for that little, that little gazelle that wanders off by itself when it should be with the rest of the herd, because that's who they're going to attack. He's not your friend. He's your adversary, the devil. And here, Nehemiah is saying, our adversaries say, they're not going to know when we attack them. They're not going to see us when we come. We're going to come among them. We're going to slay them. Hey, they, they, Paul said this in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 9. Hey, there's a great door and effectual before me, and many adversaries. We're in the presence of our enemy. He said, I'm in the devil's territory, I'm in a place where I'm exposed and I'm vulnerable. And I don't know tonight, maybe, maybe as we think about these lonesome surroundings, maybe there's somebody tonight in our church who feels just like that. You feel surrounded by the adversity, surrounded by the adversaries. David described it later on this way in Psalms 142 verse 4. I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me. I don't have a friend in the world. <laughs> I don't have a right-hand man I can turn to. That's a sad place to be, amen? I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me. Who do I trust? He said, refuge failed me. There's nowhere I can hide. Now, he found out later on, God is our refuge and strength, amen? He learned that later on. But hey, 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 but when you're surrounded by your enemies and your mind's playing games with you and your fears have overtaken your faith, and by the way, he said, that wouldn't happen to me. You just wait, it will it happen to Peter. You're gonna say like David, refuge has failed me. Then he says, no man cared for my soul. Well, I wanna give you some good news before I finish this message. No man cared for his soul, but God cares for your soul, Amen. No man may care for you, but God does, amen? And so we, we look at the situation, and maybe you feel like that. You're looking for help, but there is no help. You feel like you're in a tight spot. You feel like no man knows you. You feel like refuge is failing. You, don't know, you feel like you can't hide in the church. You can't hide in a hole. You can't hide there. You feel like there's nowhere you can hide. You don't know where to run, all these things. I'm just saying, David, as he writes this psalm, wants us to know in very living color that he was in these lonesome surroundings where he had this adversity and he had this adversary. Now, that all being said, notice how, but that's not the end of the verse. Because David just doesn't leave us talking about looking at the lonesome surrounding. He wants us to see the Lord's supply. And he says, thou hast provided for me a table, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And David now takes this moment for us to understand how the Lord supplies, how Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, the Lord who provides, shows up at the right time. And he shows up with what we need. And he shows up when we think no one else shows up. And when we think no man cares for our soul, there's a God in heaven who cares for our soul. When we think there's no refuge we can go to, thank God God is my refuge and strength, the very present help in time of need, Psalms 46 verse 1. Thank God David would learn that. But David is going to tell us about the Lord's supply here. Now, he talks about this table. He says, thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemy. Now, David, to understand that, we need to go back to an incident in David's life where David, where David is speaking about in his mind that what God did for him is what God, what David did for other people. He had a table that he prepared. I want you to take your Bibles and this is in your notes already. And look with me in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Look at Samuel Samuel chapter 9. And the story there in 2 Samuel 9, in fact, the whole chapter deals with David taking care of Jonathan's sons, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. 
And I want you to go down to verses 10 to 13 just for time. And I want you to notice how we see this, this example in David's life of the king's table here, of the king's provision, of the king's abundance. And by the way, may I say this tonight as we study the king's table, the king's table never lacks for food. And the king's table never runs out. And the king's table has bread enough, amen. And the king's table, by the way, for everyone who's saved, you're invited to eat continually at the king's table, amen. I can't figure out for the life of me why you wouldn't want to be in church because you're at the king's table when you're in church, amen? I can't figure out for the life of me why you don't want to read your Bible and why you wouldn't want to pray because you got the king's table continually at you, amen? I can't figure out for the life of me why you won't want to step out by faith and do something great for God because you got the king's table right before you, amen? I can't figure out for the life of me if our church goes back one of these days to start having building campaigns and raising money, why we wouldn't want to trust God because I want to tell you, he prepares a table before us regardless of who the enemy is, Amen? So he says here in verse 10, Thou therefore and thy sons, he's speaking to Zeba, Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring him the fruits that thy master's son may have food eaten. Now he's what he's saying. Now he has land. I want you to take care of that land. I want you to make sure that, that you till that land. I want you to make sure you harvest that land. Let's not waste the land. I want to just give you courage tonight. Let's not waste the land. Amen. He says, don't waste your opportunities there. He says, you till that land and you bring that food in. However, he says, but Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Whose table? The king's table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba the king, uh, to, to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. That's a shouting verse right there, amen. I want you to know tonight that if you just got saved, God has invited you to eat at that table just as one of the king's sons because we are one of the king's sons, Amen. He said later on, verse 12, Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Zebra were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. I mean, David extended this lifetime invitation to Mephibosheth to eat continually at the table of the king there. And he was just saying, listen, there's always bread at my table. He shall eat at my bread always at my table. There's no lack of anything. So what David remembers is he's writing Psalms 23, 5. It's this table that he ate at every Every day he was a king. This table that was sumptuously provided. Hey, remember about Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 5? Uh, he was governor over Jerusalem, and he, how he had this sumptuous table. It was a, he had a table and a feast where he fed all these people, and you can read about that in, in, in Nehemiah chapter 5, all these people he fed. And basically, the summation of everything he did there was that he had a feast that was fit for a king. And so David, this description in 2 Samuel 9, is describing what I would call tonight a feast fit for the king. He says, now what I'm going to feed myself and my guests, Mephibosheth, is welcome to have that there. So David now is in a situation where he feels like he's Mephibosheth. He's barefoot. He's thrown dirt on his head. He's desolate. He's in this hard situation. So David's thinking here, man, that, you know what? I'll just be glad if I can eat something again. I'll be glad. He's thinking just like he, he was longing for the water of Bethlehem one time. He's longing one day I hope to be back in my, 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 back in my palace. And one day I hope to be eating at that table. And that did happen. So notice how God meets his need here. Because remember I said I believe that the background to this is, is, is the Absalom revolt. Well, go with me to 2 Samuel. Samuel 17. And what David writes here in Psalms 23 is, is an after effect. Uh, it's just, the, 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 it's just the, the commentary, if you were from David, of how God took care of him as we find in 2 Samuel 17. 2 Samuel 17, verses 26 to 29, we have the story there how God, at a timely moment, met David's need here. And he says here in verse 26, So Israel and Absalom pitched in the land of Gilead. And it came to pass, when David was come to Mahanaim, notice this, three men, Shobi, the son of Nahash, of Rabbah, the chief of Ammon, and Maker, the son of Amiel, of Lodabar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite of Rogelim. And I wish I had time tonight. I could preach a message at all three of those men. Those men are heroes of the faith, as far as I'm concerned, the great men. And the Bible says this, now watch this, watch this. These three men came, and I want you to imagine with me in your mind, the great caravan these men had. I want you to imagine all the donkeys and all the horses and the caravan they had. I mean, this long, stretched-out caravan for hundreds and hundreds of David's people that stayed loyal to him, that went with him out in the wilderness, that left their homes and weren't really sure if they'd get their homes back. And they left their wealth and everything they had behind. And they went out to this wilderness there. They're just having their eyes on their king and they're trusting their king. By the way, that's a great thought just for there. Would you, are you willing to trust God in the most dire circumstances? And they go out there 
And here's what they brought. Look at this verse 20. This is incredible. They brought beds and basins and earthen vessels. And they brought these. They you know, thought about their king. Well, he, he can't be sleeping on the rocks. Uh, let's bring him, you know, the equivalent of a modified sleeping bag or something. You know what I'm saying? Let's bring him some of the equivalent of a comforter. And, and we're going to bring them food. And it's, it's, it's a lot of food. And, and, and it's, all these are dried goods. And they're going to need containers to put these in. So they brought the ample containers for all of these things there. So they brought beds and basins and earthen vessels. And, and notice this, wheat. And barley, I mean, those were their staples for bread and for barley and for flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse. I mean, these are all dried goods that they would, they would hydrate later on. They would make soups out of them and broths out of them and stews out of them, and, you know, for all the things that they need. And they would boil those things. And, and, he brought, and they brought something else they would like. They brought them honey, and they brought them butter, and they brought them sheep. And when they brought sheep, they brought sheep in abundance. And, and uh, you know, that, that means protein. That means meat for them in addition to the protein of the lentils and, and beans and so forth. And he said, and they brought them cheese of, of, of kind or cattle for David. For David. Now, David had been the place where he was providing for people, but God put him in a place where God provided for him. I learned from a preacher years ago. Another preacher was telling, he was telling this preacher, he said, um, I have a hard time taking from other people. I like to give. The Bible says more blessed to give than to receive. We understand that. And the other preacher wisely said, preacher, that's very noble of you and humble. But he said, God's going to put you in a place one of these days of your life that you can be a good receiver as well as a good giver. Until you learn to be a good receiver, sometimes you cannot really learn how to be a really good giver, too. And Dave was a place where he had been giving. He gave to Mephibosheth just a few chapters before. Now, eight chapters later, we find David being on the receiving end. David's being cared for there. And he receives all these things. And the Bible says, and honey and butter and sheep and cheese for kind. For David and for the people that were with him to eat. Notice this, for they said the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Well, notice the Lord's supply. I want you to see some lessons about the Lord's supply. Notice where, first of all, David is famished. How many understand what it means when you're really hungry? Amen? You're really hungry. I mean, you're really hungry. I mean, just like, you know, put anything in front of you, you'll eat it, right? And the Bible says in verse 29 there, the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in their adversity, in the wilderness. God gives us adversity. God gives us adversaries. That we might be able to gauge our spiritual life, to recognize we're hungry and thirsty and we're weary. Are you hungry tonight? Are you thirsty tonight? Do you sense weariness worrying on you? How do you, how do you know you're getting weary? I'll tell you how. Because, you go, you, because you're doing good by serving God, but you're starting to pull back because you feel like you're putting too much time in. Or you feel like you're imbalanced. Or you, know, you feel, you know, the devil starts whispering in your ear. When you're weary, you tend more to listen to the devil than you do to listen to God. God puts us in places, brother and sister in Christ, so he could shake us up and realize maybe we've been too full, maybe too full of ourselves and not full of him. The people are hungry and thirsty and weary. Hey, listen to this. David was on this journey. He's not riding as a shepherd. He's riding as a sheep. Listen to what Psalms 107 verse 5 says. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. When you're not feeding your soul, when your spiritual life is depleted, the Bible puts it very plainly in Psalm 107, verse 5, your soul faints within you. Now, David said earlier, he restored my soul. You know, he gets me back on my feet. But do you, do you recognize in your life that you're hungry and thirsty? Now, I'm going to say this tonight just because it needs to get out there, because next month I'm going to have 
I'm going to ask all of our prayer group leaders to meet with me so we can recalibrate our prayer groups and things. But do some of you, don't raise your hand, and don't nod your head, but do some of you feel like now, after now we've been at this for 18 months with prayer groups, is it a little bit of a difficulty for you, a challenge for you time-wise, energy, or spiritually to go to your prayer group on your designated time? If you feel that way, that's natural. But if you feel that way, aren't you glad that once you get into your prayer group, that once you start praying through those requests and watch God work into the lives of other people, aren't you glad that you went to your prayer group? Amen. Aren't you glad what God's doing there? We had, we had a prayer group last night. I can tell all the men were a little bit tired last night, but nobody was complaining about it. Nobody was, and this has been for the last couple weeks, nobody's been complaining about it. But all of us were texting each other at 9 30, 10 o'clock, 10 30 last night. Praise God. So thankful for you guys coming to the prayer group. I'm energized. I'm thankful for our time. Everybody's busy, all of those kind of things. And you know, this is a hardworking church with people that put in, a lot of people that put in more than 40 hours a week. And then they got their church ministries, things like that. You know, we just have to understand sometimes that we, we do get weary in our soul there. I read in Genesis where God sent a seven year famine in Egypt. <clears throat> That famine was so extensive, it reached its, its, its tentacles, reached itself up to Canaan land where Jacob and his sons were. Remember that? And they said, hey, we heard there's bread in Egypt. Hey, saddle up your donkeys. You better get down there. Get us, you know, go, here's some money. Put some money in your saddles there, in, in, in your, your, your satchels. He said, go down there, go to the governor and buy, 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 some, buy some food for us. Little did they know that the governor was their, their brother Joseph. And so they go down there at a time of famine, shortage, and hunger. They had to go to Joseph for food. Hey, Joseph is a type of Christ. God sometimes puts us in famine situations. So we get to Jesus. We get to Jesus for the food. Amen. But Jacob at this place, he was just kind of languishing there, and his sons were languishing. Definitely his sons were, were in a play, very bad place in their spiritual life. They were not very good sons in what they did. They hid their crime from their father. They were living with the guilt of sin. And so God had to create this situation. Isn't it amazing? God didn't send the famine land because of Egypt. God sent the famine land because he was trying to get jo Jacob and his sons all revived. He wanted to get them to Joseph. Don't you realize tonight, sometimes God has to put an adversity of a famine in your life to get you to Jesus. Amen. David, I like what Paul said about this famishing. He said in Philippians 4, 12, really jumped out at me. He said, everywhere and in all things, listen to this. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed, I'm taught. It's been ingrained in me. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry. That's part of our learning process. That's part of spiritual training. By the way, that's part of being a leader. You have to be instructed to be full and to be hungry. Then he says, both to abound and to suffer need. The modern day church doesn't suffer need because it's rich and increased with goods and having need of nothing. But Paul was at a place in life, when I was just telling somebody this the other day, I said, you know, Paul did do tent making. Tent making is just kind of, just has this new evangelical kind of twist to that, which really is not what Paul did. Paul did, he, he worked enough in making tents, which is what he learned how to do. He made enough just to make ends meet because he recognized the, the, the trade off in time. He said, I don't want to be spending my time making tents when I can be spending my time about winning people to Christ and starting churches. I'm not worried about tents, I'm worried about starting churches. I got to get, get churches started and get people into the churches. And get them to hear the gospel there. But I'm just saying today, you know, we see, we see uh, David famishing. The starting point in this Lord's supply is understanding the famishing. Now, do you know where you're at spiritually? Do you sense that you're famishing in your soul? And we see David famishing, but notice David's feast. We go back to verses 27 to 29, and we see this abundance of food that is brought for David and for the people that were with him. Every need he had for food was met. Dry goods, honey, butter, sheep, cheese. It was, it was a spread that could take care of him for a long time. And that doesn't even include one, one or two chapters before that when Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, came, who was kind of with, a, with a, an agenda behind it, but he, he came and he brought him uh, these, these asses, these donkeys filled, that were equipped with all of this, this food. I mean, it doesn't even include everything that Ziba brought him. I mean, it was an abundance of food that Shobi and, and, and Maker and, and Barzillai brought to David there. I mean, it was wonderful there. In Psalm 70, 19, as I mentioned earlier, the unbelieving Jews mocked God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? I mean, here we are in the middle of nowhere, scorpions, serpents, cactus, you know, tumbleweeds, sand, blazing heat. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? 
And David proved right here God did furnish a table in the wilderness. Amen? God took care of him. Can God take care of us when we're hungry? Yes, he can. Can God take care of you? Can God, will God give you a feast fit for a king? Well, that's what the Bible says. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Hey, don't, don't you know, if you, if you think small, you're going to get small. If you pray small, you're going to get praised small. You're going to receive small. I'm just saying tonight, David says, we see David's feast here. Uh, God, God gave David a feast fit for a king. I imagine on the backside, David was praying, God, we need some food. God, we're hungry and we're thirsting. God, you know, we've been sleeping on rocks for many days now. God is uncomfortable. We've got women here, men here, and we just, this is difficult. And he said, man, God, Lord, just look at me, Lord. I just, I, and you know, God, God heard his prayer and God sent the need and God raised up Barzillai and, and God raised up Shobi and God raised up a maker. And these men, they came, and by the way, they came at great risk to their own personal welfare. I think about Elijah. Remember Elijah, the brook Kidron, the brook, brook Kirith? God sent him bread and flesh twice a day via Heaven Express, amen? Not Fed Express, Heaven Express, amen? He had the ravens drop it off there. I mean, right on time, morning and evening, boop, bread and flesh. Everybody else is starving, not God's prophet. God, gave him a, God furnished a table for him in the wilderness. I uh, remember Elisha, Elisha during a time of famine, and the, uh, the sons of prophets came to him, and so uh, a man came to, came to him from Baal, ba Baalisha with a supply of food. It says, bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, full ears of corn, and the husk thereof. And Elisha said, you know, share it with the people, and there will be enough food that will be left over. And God did. God took care of this. Kind of a, kind of a precursor to the feeding of the multitude. Remember the feeding of the multitude? Uh, God, God took care of all that. I, I think about Proverbs 9.2, which is not in your notes there. But I think about Proverbs 9.2, just to kind of jumped in my mind here. Let me read this to you, Proverbs 9.2 about the feast and the banquets and God's provision there. Proverbs 9.2 says something like this. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has killed her beasts. This is talking about the banquet. She has mingled her wine. She has also furnished her table. I mean, just, just saying here, David, David's speaking about this feast. Thou was prepared for me, uh, thou preparest a table, a feast fit for a king in the presence of my enemies. Brother and sister in Christ, we need to rise above the circumstances and the adversities and problems and the recessions and increasing interest rate. Realize it doesn't matter about those things. We have a God in heaven who takes care of every one of our needs. God does furnish a table in the wilderness. God does meet our need. Now, it may not be according to what you think it is, but God meets our need and over and beyond that. God does furnish a table in the wilderness. I notice David is famishing, David's feast. Notice David's friends. I have to talk about that for just a moment. These three men, I mean, can you, can you imagine how dejected, how <clears throat> untrusting, maybe I could say that, David got to, while well, he's on that, got walking out there in this far off place. His son has rejected him. His trusted counsel has rejected him. And here comes this descendant of Saul, and he's cursing him out. He's just cursing him right and left, throwing rocks at him. I mean, David is this dejected place, and here comes Shobi. Here comes Maker. Here comes Barzillai. And Barzillai really stands out among the, all the, these men come alongside a great personal wisdom. Because, by the way, how could you assemble all of that food and bring the, all of those sheep and things without being noticed by Absalom and his men? I mean, can you imagine these men trying to even go back to what they were doing? Can you imagine the criticism they would receive because, because David was made to be the bad guy? And so all these people looked at David. He's the bad guy. Why are you aligning yourself with David? Hey, these men represent loyalty to the nth degree, amen? They stayed right by the stuff. They stayed right by David. They believed in David because they knew David wasn't wrong. These men stayed right there. They, there's, there's so much we could say, but these men, they got, but let me say this tonight. God uses people to supply our needs. And by the way, God uses you and I to supply other people's needs. You and I are the ravens that God uses to supply needs. And I'm just saying tonight, sometimes we look at things, you can't look at things as an expense. You have to look at things, is that an investment? Is that being a help to people? Hey, by the way, pure religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You don't have real religion if you're not taking care of other people and you're not supplying their need, amen? But then we see something else here. Notice God supplied his need when he was famishing. God supplied his need with a feast. God supplied his need with his friends. God gave, hey, listen, I learned this along the way. You're gonna have people who are gonna disappoint you. You're gonna have people that are gonna leave you. You're going to have people that will betray you. You're going to have people that are going to hurt you. But you know what? In light of all that, God supplies friends over and beyond. God gives you new friends you never thought you'd have. 
And God gives you good friends. You give it people that go to extremes for your behalf. But notice, we see David's faith. Psalms 23, 5, when he says God prepared a table before him in the presence of his enemies, he's saying, you know what? God strengthened his faith. Right there, he got this table prepared. It strengthened David, David's faith. David had to exercise faith in God. He's there in the middle of nowhere. I mean, here's a king where for, for years on end, I mean, David's in his 50s at this time. He's, he's had all his needs provided for him. Now he's had to exercise faith. Listen, it's never too late to exercise faith, amen? And you're never too old to exercise faith, and you're never too young to exercise faith. Faith is a journey. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. Things can and will get tough. God wants to have faith in him. He'll supply every need. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse 10, If thou feign the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Have faith in God's supply, amen. We see... The lonesome surroundings, I need to hurry up. The Lord supplied. But notice one last thing, and I'll go real quickly on this. I'll preach this last part another time. Would you notice a loving Savior? Now, the table's great, amen? God's provision's great, amen? God takes care of, taking care of me and you, that's great. But that's not the focal point. The focal point is the first word in that verse. Thou, who? The Lord who's my shepherd, amen? A loving shepherd. The focal point is not the table. The focal point is not me being taken care of. The focal point is the one who provides all my needs. He said, thou, Lord, thou, Lord, comfortest me. Thou, Lord, takest care of me. Thou, Lord, art my shepherd. Thou, Lord, restoreth my soul. Thou, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Now, David is reflecting and rejoicing in his love, the lovingness of this great Savior we have. We have a loving Savior who meets our need, a Savior who's there for us. And I want you to understand something tonight. This table is more than just, this is me tonight, I'm done. This is more than just the king's table. This is the Lord's table. This is the Lord's table. And I, so I studied through this a little bit and was meditating on it. I thought, oh my, this is so wonderful how this table here in Psalms 23.5 is pointing forward to another table, a table that Jesus would establish on the, the night, what we call the Last Supper, when he assembled his disciples around that table. And there, symbolically, he gave us his mission for salvation. And the mission for salvation was that Jesus came to give his life a ransom for many that Jesus gave himself for us. Jesus represents to us here in this Lord's table the mission in salvation. The mission in salvation is this, that the sacrificial offering of the body of the body of Christ and the shedding of his blood is for every sinner. God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It symbolizes that mission of salvation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He came to be the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. He bore my sins on his body on the tree. He washes us in his own blood. I mean, I look at this table and I think about how the Lord prepared a table before him. It points forward to that mission of salvation of the Lord's table that was established on the night of the Last Supper. Now we celebrate that according to 1 Corinthians 11. We celebrate that when we come together as a local church assembly in a close church assembly there and as members of the local New Testament church as saved baptized members who can testify that Jesus Christ has saved us from our sin we take that Lord's table the element of the of the element of the unleavened bread which represents the body of Jesus Christ and the element of the of the cup of the fruit of the vine which represents his shed blood we participate we partake of that to remind us there of we remember the Lord's death till he comes amen a loving savior points us to the mission of salvation but we need to see one other thing the loving savior Reminds us of the momentum in his soon coming. Ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. The Lord's table, as frequently as we do that, is to be a reminder to reset the momentum. Jesus is coming soon. One of the great explorers of days gone by was a British explorer by the name of Ernest Shackleton. He wanted to do something no man had ever done during his lifetime. He took a ship, navigated through the Arctic, crushing ice along the way. Other vessels tried to do that. They were sunken, destroyed their vessels. But they got to this place where 
the ice would open and close. They went through an opening with some of the smaller boats to go to that piece of ice, to go into, to go into land. And some of those men were stuck there. They had to wait till there was an opening. Mr. Shackleton was a very brave explorer. He took a few of his best men. He says, now the rest of you stay here. We're going to come back and rescue you. When that next time that opens up, we're going to get on these, these boats. We're going to make our way there. We're going to make all the way back. We're going to come back with a bigger ship. And we're going to get you out of here. The time came. They got on their boats, rolled their way out. They made it just before the ice closed up. Days went by. Weeks went by. The day came, Mr. Shackleton came back. They waited as they did before. There was an opening in the ice. And to Mr. Shackleton's surprise, those men were packed and they were ready to go. And as soon as those boats came in, they knew they had to rush and they had to get in there because they knew that that ice would stay open only for a short period of time. They got in those little boats. They made their way out. And as soon as that last boat made it out, the current shifted and those, ice, those icebergs started to close in again. Ernest Shackleton had said to those men, as they were all settled in, it was fortunate that you were ready when you were. And those men said this. They said, they said Admiral, we never gave up hope. We knew you'd be coming back. And we reminded ourselves every day since the day you left, to the day that you left to come back with the rescue party, he said, the boss may be coming. We better be ready. And I remind you tonight, Jesus may be coming. We better be ready. He may come at any time. The momentum of his soon coming. The Lord's table speaks volumes to us tonight about something bigger than you and me. Yes, David writes about his need. The greatest need of man today is his need for salvation, his need to get saved. The greatest need of every Christian is to be what Jesus speaks about, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, that we might be filled. Do you sense the need in your life? Do you sense you're hungry and thirsty and that your soul is weary and that you're depleted? How about come park yourself at the altar, park yourself at the word of God, and get refilled with God's presence and power. He said, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Let's stand, please.